What's up, everybody? Seth Fan here, and uh, we're here for episode six of Classic Cast. And I'm here with Tip Sound. I'm here with Stay Safe. And what doing? we want to do today is go into rating with you guys. Go into raid design a little bit more in depth than we have in the past. Now, rating isn't something that, uh, or at least preparing for rating, isn't something that necessarily starts once you get level 60, but it's it's something that's really all-encompassing uh, throughout the course of the game. Not necessarily that the the only thing that you want to do in, in Vanilla WoW, that's not necessarily the end goal for everybody, but if you do want to raid, there's things that happen throughout the entirety of the game to help prepare you for that. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, raids in Vanilla WoW, they take, they're, they're definitely something to aspire to. They take a lot of time to work into and progress into and it mm -hmm. starts at level one to be totally honest it starts at level one when you make your character that that long progression uh leveling gearing professions networking building a, a network of people you can finally you know 39 other friends yours you can go into the raid with yeah level one raiders boys <laughs> now <laughs> but uh but for real like if you think about it it takes what like the average player at least back in vanilla around 300 hours to cap at 60. And then you've got to do all of the different dungeons, gearing up, pre-raid BIS, leveling your professions, doing the attunements, reputation grinds. It probably would take the average player around 400-ish hours to even set foot in the raid. I mean, cross-compare that to today when you could literally just log in and queue up for an LFR right away. So if you were raiding in vanilla, you were definitely amongst the elite, I guess you could say. Definitely in good company. Yeah, absolutely. Um one of the big things that I think that we should really start off talking about is, um, I mean, how how leveling, right? Let's just start with leveling, right? Pre-60 content, let's start with leveling. How just getting your abilities and learning how to use your abilities in different dungeons, right? Learning how to use your abilities in different dungeons, working your way up, uh, whether that's something as simple as like CC or using like uh, kicking, right? Interrupt mechanics. Stuff like that translates throughout the course of the entire game, and it, it leads into the raids, for sure. Yeah, like you said, learning how to taunt, learning how to interrupt, learning how to banish, learning how to sap, learning how to hibernate mobs, all this stuff you're going to, you learn at level, you start learning at like a level 15 or something, right? And then you're going to hone your skills all the way up to 60, and that's when it, it's really going to matter. Exactly. I think there's a big misconception about vanilla. I've been hearing it a lot lately is that some classes are like, you know, basically have a one button rotation in raids, which to some extent can be true sometimes, but I don't think there's a single class that doesn't have to reach deep into its spell book to execute in a raiding environment. I mean, it just, you're going to be using all of your aggro resets. You're going to be using your flavor abilities. You're going to be using, like say your train shots, et cetera. It doesn't matter what class you play. If you want to be a good player, a top player, you're, you'll are you basically be using everything and you will be learning how to use everything as you level up, as S-Fan Stay Safe said. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And and not only just learning how to use your abilities. It's not just that, uh, but also even certain dungeons and stuff and, and getting pieces of gear early on. Uh, I know Stay Safe, you had some thoughts on that if you if you want to go ahead and go in on that. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, as far as like getting ready to raid, you can start getting some pre-raid best in slot pieces in your mid 40s or early 40s. You can start doing your attunement uh, for Molten Core and Ixia in your mid 50s. So raiding isn't something that just you you start thinking about it once you're 60. You can start preparing for it long before you ever hit 60. And it feels so much more organic that way. Like if you think about it, it doesn't feel like its own isolated game mode, like on its own island. It just feels so naturally woven into the overall game experience. Like there's yeah. just, it's a very seamless transition from leveling dungeons, et cetera, going into your attunements. And a lot of them go hand in hand. I, I One thing I don't like about some of the rating today is it just feels like it's this separate game system, which is separate from dungeons, which is separate from world quests and all that stuff. It's nice in vanilla how it really feels like it's this organic experience and journey. You go through these milestones, but they all kind of interlock at certain points. I really like that. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you think about it, you know, you're, you're on your way, you're leveling to 60, right? And if you are in the Burning Steps, I believe the Burning Steps is where you start the Molten Core attunement. The start the quest chain for Molten Core, or is it Anixia? It's the Anixia attunement, I believe, starts in Burning Steps, actually. Yeah, and, and it's, it's you're, you're just there, you're questing, you're just running around, picking up quests left and right, you know, trying to level. And, you know, next thing you know, you're halfway through an attunement. And you might not have any idea, right? 
you're reading the right. quest text and you're, you're learning this, you're learning that. And of course, these days we, we understand what all the attunements are and uh, even, you know, partway through vanilla, people started to understand like what quests were the attunement changed, of course. But if you're, if you're not in tune with that, if you're not already like in the know, it's something that, you know, like Tip said, is, is very, very seamless. It's like, I'm just leveling, right? And I happen to have gotten attuned with Anixia just because I'm, I'm playing it like a completionist and I'm just going through this whole quest chain, right? And what's so cool about them is they're, they're very, the, all the attunement processes, they're very long and story driven. And mm -hmm. there's some lore if you care about that. And uh, they're just like actually genuinely fun to do. And like you said, you can get halfway through or you can even maybe do the whole thing without even realizing that, oh, that's an attunement for a raid. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And for those that, that maybe like started later on, I think I think Wrath of, or, yeah, Wrath of the Lich King, I think it was the first expansion that kind of took attunements away. For those that didn't play, an attunement is essentially some kind of like prerequisite for a raid, usually in the form of a quest. Mm -hmm. So like in order to enter a particular raid or to get like fast access to a raid, you have to finish certain quest lines. So like Molten Core, you have to do this thing in BRD where you go in and touch this orb. And Nixia, it's a whole big thing. Alliance and Horde had, had different uh, objectives. But it's basically, it's just another layer of progression, another obstacle to, to kind of vault over before you actually enter a raid. And, and because it's another obstacle, it kind of gives raids an even more exclusive and prestigious reputation. So mm -hmm. just in case, you know, for those that, that didn't know what that is. Yeah, and I think uh, so. So Wrath didn't have you know, just to touch on this a little bit. They they had completely gotten rid of all the attunements at that point because I, I think yeah. Yeah. well yeah. I think it was at the very end of Burning Crusade they got rid of the twenty five man attunements for SEC and Tempest Keep. Is that right? Karazhan, they got rid of the Karazhan. Yeah. 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 So yeah, it's it's kind of interesting like how that progression happened. Like it went from being such a core value of the game or a core core design principle of like you have to go through this series of tasks to prove yourself to the game that that you can go and complete that level of content but there or, or attempt that level of content but then it eventually got to the point where it was just like ah, just get them in there right you don't need to do all this stuff i'm guessing blizzard probably realized how great its rating was especially compared to like rival mmos at the time that they thought on its own, it could be such an enticing feature to, to keep players playing. And they were probably right for a little while, but at some point, you know, by allowing players to access the raids automatically, it kind of diminished what raids were in the beginning. And it was just, mm -hmm. it had that kind of catch-22. And the only the only attunement you could, I think you technically had in Wrath of the Lich King, on Saffron, you got the key to the focusing Iris to unlock Malagos, but it was like, it was so easy and you only needed one parade. And really, it was it wasn't an attunement. I mean, you got it naturally right. by killing Saffron. So yeah, yeah. The cool thing about these attunements is also like before, like just just stepping foot in the raid, you already felt like you would accomplish something, right? You didn't even have to kill a boss. You you felt like you had already worked your way and earned something. Just stepping mm -hmm. foot into the raid. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think so for sure. I think uh, I think that's a big deal too. Um, one, it, it's funny. So, so I was on recently with uh, with, with Def Camp and Melderon, and and they do a podcast too. It's called Def Talk, and I talked about how there's a uh, there there's a level of success that you can feel without actually having to go and and do the raids, right? Without having to complete like the the very tip top content. Because there's a bunch of small wins throughout the course of vanilla, whether that's getting your, you know, getting a level, putting that talent point in. Like you, you have small level, small wins, and it, and it gives you levels of satisfaction, right? Like it's like no, I feel like I'm getting stronger. I feel like I'm getting more powerful. I'm I'm doing uh, I'm doing Maradon, and I'm getting my Blackstone Ring while I'm leveling up, and it turns out that Blackstone Ring is pre-raid bis. It's the pre-raid bis hit ring for a melee, right? Stuff like that, it really adds up, and uh, I, I don't know. I think that's something that's uh, that's really cool. It's the same thing with the attunements, right? Each step of the attunement, finally getting attuned, getting in there, getting to kill a boss before you complete the whole raid. Yeah, it made it so yeah. like the the gear was just the cherry on top. Like just entering the raid, that's it. You you've you've already done three hundred hours of leveling. Um, you've already done your attunements. You've gotten gear along the way. You've done a ton of dungeon grinding. Just setting for you, you've you've apt to a guild and you've gotten accepted into a guild with mm -hmm. you know thirty nine other people plus. Just being able to to step in and zone in that first time, 
you know, gear or no gear, it doesn't matter. You know, there was, it's just, it's a sense of accomplishment just by setting, setting foot inside. Mm -hmm. No doubt. No doubt. So uh, talking about gear a little bit, right? We, we, we talked about the attunements. We talked about having to do the attunements to get into the raids. Uh, but there's also, there, there's more preparation that needs to be done than just simply getting attuned, right? You need to have consumables ready. You need to have uh, the proper gear to go in. Uh, do, do one of you guys kind of want to take the reins and, and kickstart that for us? Yeah, like you said, your attunements, you got those out of the way. You maybe got some of your pre-raid best in slot. Uh, some people in your raid, primarily your tanks, are going to need some some fire resistance gear for Anixia mm-hmm. and Molten Core, right? Um, someone's going to have to farm some Hydraxian Waterlord's rep, so you can mm-hmm. uh, do the douses. There's a lot more that, that goes into it than just uh, than just showing up. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Like, and I want to I want to highlight a couple of those real quick. So, like, in order to even summon Major Domo Executus in the Molten Core. You basically had to get certain reputation with Hydraxian Water Lord so you could get uh, the Quintessence. Is it ter- Eternal Quintessence is the one that's like on an hour cooldown. And uh, there's like several runes. I think there's like six or seven runes in Molten Core. You have to douse them with this item that you just received, and a certain mm-hmm. amount of people in your, in your raid should have it. And uh, that's what allows you to summon Major Domo, and then he obviously, you know, you kill him, he summons Ragnaros. But... Um, well, and also it's it's an aqua quintessence early on in the game, and they changed it to an eternal quintessence, yeah. where it's put on a cooldown as opposed to the aqua quintessence originally, where you had to go back every week, and and realistically, you'd have to have eight people in your raid. Uh, is it? It's eight, right? Uh, I'm, 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 I believe it's eight. Yeah, I, yeah. I remember yeah. early molten core progression, but like uh, competing for like a server first molten core or something, uh, we only had like two or three people that actually had the quintessence when you we were yeah. going in there. Yeah. So they douse. We'd kill a boss. They douse. They'd go out, get a new one. We'd summon them back, and it was like a really convoluted experience. Yeah. <laughs> so it's uh, it's something that realistically, like you get to the point where like that's not particularly feasible. But if you're doing like the early early progression, early on in the life of a server, then th- that's probably what you're stuck doing is, is having guys go back and get summoned. So it's pretty all- cool. It's almost like its own attunement within the raid, sort of thing. You know? <laughs> yeah. It's own, like prerequisite. Yeah, it is actually. And uh, we were talking a little bit about resist gear, right? We were talking a little bit about resist gear. Uh, pre-raid bis is something that I want to talk about. And, and and something that, you know, back in the day, t- today we have all the resources in the world, right? Today we know, like, I, I, I need the Devil Source set if I'm a melee DPS. I need this, I need that. Back in the day, people might have just gone into a raid and, you know, you might be a paladin wearing Lightforge gear. And in reality, the Lightforge gear, like, that's not really good for anything in raiding. Like, it's it's not really good for DPS. It's not really good for healing. And uh, with the other classes as well, like, even for a warrior, like, you might wear, like, a couple pieces of Valor just because, like, you might be stuck. But that's not really the most optimal thing because the Valor gear doesn't really have defense on it. Right? Huh. So, uh, you know, for a healer, right, for a Paladin, for example... If I'm if I'm playing a holy paladin, I'm gonna go get like robes of the exalted. I'm gonna be wearing a lot of cloth gear and stuff like that to to really maximize my performance with pre raid gear as best as I can in order to complete the raid content and get the better gear. And <clears throat> you'll see like a lot of the early raid gear as well in in MC uh, in an XE a little bit. This tier gear especially is is not particularly uh, conducive to optimal performance. Yeah, yeah, it's not at all. I, I was going to say a lot of the Warlock Tier 1 gear, uh, the Fellheart gear you see right above my, my head here, has a bonus fire damage on it. And, well, all the bosses are immune to fire damage, so it's completely useless yeah. for in a raid environment. Exactly. And you didn't have any tier tokens, so if you're if you're going for, like, a Fury DPS set, Might's not going to help you, Wrath is not going to help. Basically, nothing helps you until, like, you. But, yeah, mm-hmm. it's it creates this kind of... You know, it, it's almost like... A symbiotic relationship between tier sets and non-tier pieces it makes it so obviously you benefit a lot more by having the optimal pieces but at the same time you get some benefit outside of raids possibly in different situations by using the tier sets so it's it kind of it's a completely different philosophy to gearing i think and specifically as when you mentioned like resistances like Mm -hmm. obviously resistance pieces and again for those that that maybe didn't play you know earlier on in uh in world of warcraft's lifespan 
there, there are certain pieces of armor that just naturally have higher resistances to certain schools of spells. So like fire resistance obviously makes you uh, more resistant to fire spells, shadow, etc. Um, some bosses just, just did a lot of fire damage or they did a lot of shadow damage or nature damage like an AQ that it became pretty much impossible for healers to keep up with the healing without players in the raid equipping an alternate set of resist gear. Mm -hmm. And I think even in the world first uh, Ragnaros kill, it's, it's on YouTube, you can see it. The rogue's perspective, you see the rogue kind of vanish out to get out of combat and swap his gear to, to fire resist gear. It just shows you kind of how, how much preparation you had to do. You had to prepare pretty much an alternate set aside your DP, mm -hmm. aside from your DPS or your main set in order to, to be able to, I guess, take in some of these abilities. And again, it goes back to the preparation. It goes back to the exclusivity, the prestige. Just setting foot in a raid means you did all of these micro steps on the way. It, it just, it, you know, it really makes you appreciate just being in the raid itself. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, just one more point, you know, like, I know the warrior gear was pretty good, right, for tanking. Mm -hmm. And then that's that's about it, right? So so you for a lot of classes you were uh stuck using these offset pieces as well and and particularly for fury warriors, there's not really anything fury warrior specific. There's not really any plate DPS gear until I believe 1.5 is whenever they added the flame guard gauntlets and onslaught girl and MC, which are the, uh, flame guard gauntlets i believe are the best uh plate dps specifically plate dps gauntlets until aq40 gauntlets of annihilation and then onslaught girdle uh until nax girdle the mentor so it, it's crazy kind of like how, how stuff like this is is put into the game and uh it's it's still useful so uh kind of talking about some some general raid design stuff there's i i think there's a lot that goes into the the construction of a raid Right, in regards to uh, how things are laid out from from like a lore perspective, like I know MC actually has like a lot of lore behind it, where you you can go online, you can read a lot about that in terms of how the the uh, the caverns are are designed the way they are, right? Why why Lucifron is where he is? Why is Magmadar behind Lucifron? Stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, it, it's pretty cool from that perspective, but also from a gameplay perspective. One of the big things that they they do, and I know Stay Safe was talking about this a little bit earlier. Uh, we were talking about it before the class cast, is how they they look at each fight and then they see what is each class doing during this fight. So, Stay Safe, do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. So I mean, all through Vanilla WoW, um, Blizzard was sort of had this question in the back of their mind: What is not only each class but each spec doing uh, during this encounter? Are you a rogue and you're disarming a trap? Are you a warlock and you're banishing on Gar? Are you a hunter and you're trank shotting? Are you a druid and you're hibernating something? They wanted every... It, it, it's not possible maybe to have every class do something unique on every fight, but throughout a raid, you know, everyone should be, should do something unique to them. And mm -hmm. I, I really like that idea. I mean, it does make everyone feel like they're, they're bringing something. Even if you're not a warrior or a rogue and you're top in the meters, right? Uh, you're still bringing something that no one else can bring. Mm -hmm. exactly and i think it was legion that kind of i feel like it was legion that completely backtracked on, on this philosophy it feels like every spec and i think this is true every spec basically only has its spec abilities right mm -hmm. so like if you're if you're like a, an arms warrior or if you're like a, a balanced druid you only have balanced druid abilities you don't have any abilities like i'm not even sure if you can power shift correct me if i'm wrong i'm not sure but there definitely seems to be a lot of abilities that have been stripped down within the class itself. And kind of the cool thing about, about vanilla is let's say, you know, you're doing really poorly or something like that. Your raid is about to wipe and you're a warrior, you're alive, even though you're a DPS warrior, you can pop defensive stance, pop taunt, tank the boss a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, you can do a lot of different things within the context of your class, not just the context of your spec that can contribute. And yeah. I know as you play a lot of paladin, like, We've had this conversation before, but like throwing out heels as a rep paladin in a raid, for mm -hmm. example. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I, like I don't know how many times I've saved a white with a lay on hands, like just a clutch lay on hands, and you know having a DPS do that, right? Having a DPS do that as opposed to like a holy paladin, where now your holy paladin's out of mana, right? It's like okay, I'm not gonna do any damage now that I lay on hands. It's like okay, well, tough luck, right? But if your healers are out of mana, then you're probably gonna wipe, you know. So uh, just being able to do that, maybe if uh, if I need to DI, if I need to put out a bop on somebody. I've saved a lot of wipes because of bops, too, because some idiot pulls aggro, <laughs> and then you have to bop them. 
but uh, you know that that kind of helps save the day a little bit. And uh, having having these different uh, different forms of utility. I know you talked about like a, a warrior having to pick, you know put on a shield and tank for a second. That'll happen. Okay, it, it usually doesn't last very long. But mm-hmm. take a take a fight like Velastras in in BWL, where I mean Fury Warriors are climbing threat all the time, and it's just because you, you, whenever you have uh, uh, limitless resources, limitless energy, mana, rage, or, um, you might get in a situation where you're gonna have to pop on a shield and tank for about three or four seconds before you die. You know, if if too many tanks die or, or whatever for whatever reason, um, I know I've seen that happen quite a bit personally. So, uh, yeah, I, I think the utility, the added utility that that people bring to a raid is is big time for sure. And you mentioned Bop. It's it's synergistic utility as well. You know, as a warlock, oh, my camera's blurry there. We're good. Okay. As a warlock, uh, having a paladin bot me when I say, yo, bot me is really good for me because I can avoid some threat problems, right? Mm-hmm. So synergistic utility as well. That's really, mm-hmm. really cool. Uh, one, th- one cool thing about Vanilla WoW. Yeah, I know what... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, like, it gives <clears throat> classes their own unique spotlight. Like, it makes you feel special. I'm not going to lie. Like... Oh my God, I just, I just, you know, took off, you know, I, I saved the, the rate of wipe with like five seconds of just knowing to, to go into defensive stance and taunt the boss for a second or like a clutch lay on hands. We just saved the raid basically. And yeah. like even things like, you know, mind controlling uh, ads like on Resuvius in Molten Core, or like Grand Widow for Lena, like priest can mind control the ads yeah. there. And that's like in axe yeah i'm sorry to say molten core yeah, <laughs> yeah. well we're talking about one core you're fine oh yeah yeah but um <clears throat> but yeah like it just it, it gives it gives you as just like a member of a specific class it, it gives you a point of pride and just kind of a way to to, to like a spotlight on yourself and mm-hmm. it, it, again it's it's makes you feel that, valuable makes you feel valuable exactly exactly mm-hmm. yeah i mean early on in molten core progression uh, as a warlock uh i can pretty much expect to be you know at bottom dps Mm-hmm. I'm one of the worst DPS classes, but I know like uh, we're not killing uh, Gar unless I do my job. Right. Mm-hmm. So I am providing a value even if it's not a DPS value. <laughs> right. Yeah, and it's you you get that experience, and this is one thing that that I think Blizzard did a really good job of is you see like in trash pulls, you see it in earlier bosses, earlier encounters. There's, uh, like, miniature versions of what you see later on constantly throughout Vanilla. And uh, one of those things is, you know, like you said, the, the banishes on Gar, stay safe. Like, you have to banish the, the elementals on the on the trash pulls in MC. So it's just like, hey, I have this ability. Like, this ability exists, and I'm going to use it. Simply, like, pressing that button and knowing that that's something that's, like, in your arsenal kind of puts that on the table in regards to, like, oh, like, mentally it's on the table for, like, oh, hey, this is one way that we can do the Gar fight. Later on, you can AOE pull, and that you know when you out gear it, essentially you can do all that. Right. But yeah. early on, uh, I mean, you can't really do it without warlocks early on for sure. So, also with hunters, hunters and trank shot, right? So in MC, Absolutely. trank shot, trank shot drops off of uh, Lucifron, guaranteed drop every single time, and then immediately after Lucifron is Magmadar. So you need trank shot to uh, basically. Sub, subdue <laughs> subdue Magmadars in Rage. And, and yeah, I talk with my hands. Persian, you know, it is what it is. But um, to subdue Magmadars in Rage. And you can't, I mean, you can't kill him without being able to do that. Uh, it's, well, particularly not early on. And, you know, your first attempt at him, the first week that you do Mag, you're going to have one Trank. So those Tranks have to be on point. Later on, you're going to have two, right? Because it's, it's a guaranteed drop to get one Trank shot book every week. You know, so it's it's designed to become easier automatically the second week that you kill Lucifron. Exactly. And what Pretty does he cool. mean by Trank Shot book, by the way? So, like, for those, again, who didn't play, you know, in Vanilla, mm-hmm. um, certain abilities, like the highest abilities in the game, um, some of them have books associated with them that gives you, like, an extra rank of a spell or gives you the spell itself. Mm-hmm. So, uh, like what he was saying, like, you kill the boss, it drops the book. Essentially, hunters can learn that ability by killing that boss, and it's an item. So you consume it, and then all of a sudden you know the ability. Very cool, by the way. I love that. Mm-hmm. I'm really sad that, that was taken out of the game. I think it's just awesome in RPGs in general mm-hmm. to kind of have certain abilities reserved for like only the players that were able to conquer the biggest challenges. Mm-hmm. But um, but yeah, so that's that's what Fan was referring to when he said the book. But yeah. yeah, no, that was good. That was good to to make sure to highlight that for anybody who who might not happen to have done that. Um, yeah. <clears throat> 
something else uh, I think we should touch on is is also like the social aspect of the game and, and communication. And this kind of harkens back to what we were saying with with leveling. You're building relationships constantly throughout the leveling process, doing dungeons. Once you're 60, gearing up, like you're going to have to group with people to do certain parts of attunement chains. These are the people that you're more than likely going to be seeing quite often. You know, it, it's kind of like uh, it, it's that's the community that that's everybody talks so much about in vanilla, right? That's the that's the community that kind of starts building. That's what you you put yourself into, and. Uh, I think it's important, this is just something to kind of mention, it's important to not do anything to damage those relationships. Not, you know, don't go and try and ninja something, because people are going to remember. People are going to remember your name, and that, that's one of the things in Vanilla WoW that's, uh, you can't really, uh, you don't want to ruin your name, because that's that's one of the most important things that you got. So, something to keep in mind. And more than that, if you're like, mercilessly ganking some horde guy, you know, 15 levels later, he might come back with his boys and recognize your name and he's going to camp you for hours. But yeah, I mean, I say this all the time, players respond to incentives. Mm -hmm. And in Vanilla WoW, it is very incentivized to make friends, have a community and accomplish things together. You can't do, you, you almost can't do anything on your own. You're going to have to have friends. And, and, and the only way to make friends is to talk to people and play with people. Mm -hmm. Wait, wait, so you're saying I have to talk to somebody in MMO? You're saying I have to talk to someone in MMO? I, I don't know. I don't know, man. It, it doesn't sound very fun to me. Maybe there will be a classic craft speed dating app or something, or like speed friend <laughs> app. I don't know. Exactly. There's gonna there's gonna be WoW Tinder. It's yeah. just gonna be an add-on. <laughs> Somebody's gonna make a WoW Tinder add-on. It's gonna use Ace. It's gonna be great. Just people are gonna be like, do you? You know, like just put your raid experience down. It's like, oh, swipe right <laughs> if you want them in your raid. Swipe left if you don't. You know, it's that simple, really. Exactly. I mean. One thing that like I very much respect and admire about Vanilla is just the overall atmosphere in a raid from like a social standpoint. Like what, what S, uh, Stay Safe and S fans said, these guys are your homies, typically, if you've been in a raid. Um, you've spent hundreds of hours leveling. Chances are, maybe depends on the size of your server, but you might have encountered these people beforehand in the world while you were leveling. Um, that guy, that, that warlock is the, you know, warlock that's got enchanting that you always see spamming in, in mm -hmm. Ironforge or Orgrimmar. Um, everybody kind of has their own identity and you've spent so much time with them before you've even entered the raid that naturally th there's just a lot of cohesive bonds in the raid. Um, and, and naturally you have so much more dependency on one another because of all the experiences you've had outside the actual instance. So when you're in that raid, especially with 40 people, there's a lot of opportunity to just like talk to people within the raid. And I guess it depends on how hardcore of a guild you have and how serious you take raiding. But mm -hmm. one of the cool things about vanilla, especially in molten core, you know, the earlier raids, it's not the same kind of experience as, as the raids today. You can have this kind of socially lax environment talking to people while you're raiding, obviously, so long as you're, you know, you're doing the mechanics and stuff like that. But again, just having 40 people together, it's such a big party. It's mm -hmm. just a great opportunity just to chat, to talk, hang out with people you know, people you don't see too often, or people that you've had, you know, again, like 300 hours of relationships with. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think your raid environment depends on the kind of guild you're in, too. You know, you might be in a more hardcore guild that's a lot more, uh, they're not going to talk very much in raid. Like, that, that'll happen sometimes. But then you might be in a little bit more casual guild where people are, you know, popping off and making stupid jokes and stuff, and... That you know, that's cool too. It's just you you have that opportunity to essentially choose what kind of guild you want to be in, right? As a guild leader, you have that opportunity to choose what kind of guild you want to have, and uh, you know, however different people want to do it, like that's cool, right? That's up to them. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of that, depending on the type of guild you're going to be in, I'm going to kind of do a transition here. Depending on the type of guild you're in, you will uh, you know min max to different levels. World buffs mm -hmm. being one of them. You know, if you're in sort of a more casual guild. Mm. world buffs might not be mandatory maybe one of you guys can explain what world buffs are but if you're in a hardcore guild you're getting your world buffs every every day before you go to your raid mm -hmm. and sometimes for several days before you go to your raid depending on yes, uh yes what, what you roll at the dark moon fair or whatever you know <laughs> and uh, yeah i'll go into world buffs a little bit and uh world buffs are something i'm i'm a big fan of personally I know there's uh it, it's funny there's actually quite a few members of the more high-end community that don't like world buffs uh, and, and they have their reasons for that. <laughs> yeah. But uh, for me, 
Yeah, I, I like the world buffs because I get personally, selfishly, uh, I get a really big benefit out, out of them being a class that uses both spell stats and melee stats, right? But what these world buffs do is generally whenever you talk about world buffs, kind of the core main world buff set that people talk about is Dire Maul North tribute buffs, right? You go run Dire Maul North tribute, you skip all the bosses, and then at the end you get a buff from killing the king, right? You kill the king. And then you get a, uh, and then you get a buff by talking to like one of his peasants or whatever. And now you're the new king. So now all the ogres become friendly to you, and you can go back and talk to all the bosses. And each boss gives you a, a special buff. So that, that that's that's you get three percent spell crit, I believe, two hundred attack power, and fifteen percent stamina. Uh, I'm 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 kind of drawing a blank on that one, but you get a stamina buff, stamina, attack power, and spell crit buff, and. That's just where it starts. Because you also have the Anixia head buff or the Dragon head buff, really, because it's either Anixia or Nefarian. And that gives you uh, that gives you spell and melee crit and attack power. And that's that's dropped in Stormwind. And I believe there's actually a six hour timer on it. Am I remembering that right? There there's a there's a set timer on the dragon head that, that drops, which isn't actually a thing on uh, on, on private servers. On private servers have gotten rid of that because there's so many people that need to use their their dragon buffs that that's a change that they've made on many private servers. Um, but I, I believe in retail vanilla that that's something that had a had a cooldown timer on it, if, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I didn't know that. Uh, maybe I learned something today. Yeah, I, I think I think there was a cooldown timer on it. Uh, also for the horde, the horde I believe if you did, I think now I'm not a horde player, so. Maybe maybe tips can can correct me on this, but the the War Chief's blessing is uh, like a fifteen percent haste buff. I, I think three hundred HP, but I think that's from killing Rend as part of the Anixia attunement quest. Is that right? I mean, I'm not a Horde player, dude. I just started on Horde. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. I, I thought I thought you might have played Horde vanilla. I wasn't sure. No, no, no. I mean, I did it back in the day, but I didn't raid during vanilla. Back oh, in the day, okay, so. okay. There you go. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the War Chief's Blessing is, is a Horde-specific buff, uh, and the, the Dragon Head buff for, um, that, that's something that the Alliance has. Um, kind of a side note, sorry, I think, have you seen, there's like an old ThoughtBot post, sorry, I was coughing, of an Alliance player that was accidentally in Duratar, and he, he happened to be there when, when Horde popped War Chief's Blessing on ThoughtBot way back in the day, he posted about this, yeah. and he got the War Chief's Blessing buff. Like it, it might have been a bug, but he was able to get it. Uh, oh, without, without being mind controlled or anything. Yeah. Wow, that's wild. That's wild. I wonder, I wonder Could if have been it a bug. Stack. I don't know. Would it stack with a dragon head buff? It does. As far as I know, it does stack so, yeah. because I've heard of people going in and, and mind controlling themselves inside of Ogremar. They mind control themselves inside of Ogremar, and then they get the buffs as alliance. But that's crazy. If it, it maybe it was bugged or something that, and he got it without a. Or maybe he was lying. <laughs> For all we know, it's somebody, I it's somebody on the internet. Too. Who knows, man? Yeah. But, but either way, yeah, there's uh, world buffs are, are a big part. Songflower is another one. Songflower is something that um, it's in it's in Fellwood. You go, you have to cleanse the songflower, and uh, it's, it's like it looks like an herb on the ground, right? And you can you can get uh, either through killing people or through enchanting. Those are the two ways I know how to do it. Uh, you can you can get the salve. To cleanse the song flower, and then once it's cleansed, you can use the song flower, and you get a five percent crit buff. Uh, spell and that's another crit. one. Where on private servers, you can have an entire raid get it all, all forty people off of one song flower. In mm. actual vanilla, I'm ninety nine point nine nine percent sure only one person can get the buff from one song flower. So you didn't have forty man raid groups stacking and clicking the song flower at the exact same time to get. You know what I mean? I think yeah. that's a, a private server meme. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously there's there's ZG, you get hmm. the stat bonus. But I think the, the point of world buffs, I think, you know, in this conversation is like, it's another layer of preparation. It's another hmm. way to mint max. It's another, it's just another thing you can do before a raid, especially if you want to be like of the most elite players. Um, and it just, it, again, it shows you that vanilla raiding, one of the reasons why it was so challenging aside from the mechanics and the boss encounters themselves is just the amount of prep work you had to do going into them week in week That's out day in day out uh, day in day out the amount of consumable farm you had to do how much gold you had to farm depending on what your uh, professions were like there's just so many small things 
that you have to do it. And over a while, obviously, builds up and it makes you have to play more and more. So that's why there's the meme about vanilla players. Like, if, if you were a hardcore raider in vanilla, you were playing a lot just to just to maintain, sustain your uh, your raid attendance, basically. But, yeah, it just a lot of people say that, you know, vanilla wasn't hard because, you know, of mechanical difficulty. And that's arguable here or there. We'll talk about that later. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that really did make it a challenge was how much prep you had to do before you even set foot in a raid. That's true. Maybe maybe more so than any other game that I've played, other than maybe old school RuneScape. Uh, of classic WoW rewards, uh, time invested more than any other game I've played. Maybe mm. you you it'll be very hard to be a top raider or a top, especially a top PVPer if you can't uh, throw your life at the game. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so I, I'd like for us to move on into talking about the raids more specifically. And uh, of course, molten core. We, we've touched on molten core a little bit, but but I kind of want to go in uh, a little bit deeper on the the importance of molten core, right? And it's one thing that's that's prevalent in in li on the live WoW servers right now, in 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 World of Legion, right? Whenever a new raid tier comes out, old raid tier is trashed. It's done. Set it aside. Drop your phone. And, and move along, right? That's not the case at all in Vanilla WoW. There's stuff in Molten Core. You know, I talked about the Flame Guard Gauntlets and the Onslaught Girdle earlier. There's tons of items in there that are useful, and not, not only useful, but the best items that you can get for months because you have several raid tiers before leading up to, you know, AK40 and, and into Nax, right? Sometimes um, years, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, literally. I mean, like, literally, like, you, you're going to be doing MC for almost a couple years before getting an item that you need, you know, or you could go a couple years and not get an item that you need and then get finally the replacement item in AQ40 or in Nax. Um, you know, just, to, just to name a few, we already talked about Onslaught, we already talked about Flame Word Gauntlets, but uh, Cauterizing Band is a best in slot healing ring until AQ40. There's Enchants, there's Recipes. Uh, 30 spell power, 55 healing. Lionheart Helm is the best in slot plate DPS helm until... I, I don't think... It, it's it's arguably replaceable in AQ40, I believe, but I, I don't even think you can actually replace it until next. Yeah. Like, it, it just yeah. kind of depends on how you build your gear. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah, and I mean, even, even let's say you had an entire raid roster that had all of those items and you had all the enchants, you can never have too many Thunder Furies, right? You're mm -hmm. going to be going and trying to get the bindings if you want a soul frost eye you're going to do that every week mm -hmm. you're going to have to do a nixia every week maybe twice a week because mm -hmm. uh, the reset's like three and a half days or something to get your ani heads to do your world buffs like uh, you will you will be progressing through nax and still going back and doing molten core always mm -hmm. exactly so that content is just never invalidated and Again, it's it's something I just started playing Legion kind of seriously yesterday. I dabbled in it a little bit, but yesterday was like my my intent to like kind of start. And it's just insane. Emerald Nightmare, um, uh, uh, the one with Ghoul Dan. What is it called? Uh, I don't even know. Raid, uh, the Suramar Raid, whatever it's called. Uh, Tomb of Sargeras. All of these raids, I'm never going to see, at least not at the competitive, at the high end level, because nobody's going to ever want to do them. And uh, sure, you, you can do them in LFR, but even in LFR, they don't reward the gear that's like comparable to like Argus gear, for example. And uh, Burning mm -hmm. Crusade did this really well too. But, but the idea of keeping content relevant throughout an entire expansion's life cycle, that's why people say at the end of Vanilla, there was never more content in WoW except that period of time. Because you just had so much to do and you always had an incentive to do it. For whatever reason, over time, it seems like those incentives to, to relive the older content have just been stripped away. There are reasons for it, but it's just it's kind of sad to see. But it's cool to see that that wasn't the case back in the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think there's also stuff that happens in Molten Core. They kind of like the first like big obstacles, the big tests. Um, so, you know, like spam decursing on, on Lucifron, right? Like learning that, like okay, we we can we need to fear ward you know, on Anixia. We need to fear ward the tanks. There's something like fear ward or um, tremor totem for for our horde friends. Uh, it, it's something that becomes a, a core mechanic. It, it's it's fears on bosses are a core mechanic in the game, and and having a way to counter them, whether it's with uh, stance dancing using berserker rage, fear ward, tremor totem. 
uh, or even having this is what we do in our raids. I'll get a fear ward in addition to the tanks, and just one at the start, right? I get one fear ward at the start, and whenever I get that first set of fears, I cleanse, I spam cleanse people who are feared. So I, I'm there to kind of reduce the amount or increase the raids DPS overall by reducing the amount of fears uh, that are full duration, essentially. Um, it just, it just stuff like that, that that you start to see, you know, and, and being a paladin and the class specific things that we talked about a little bit earlier, you know, I, I have a cleanse. Even though I'm DPSing, I can still spam cleanse. Uh, like on Viscidus and AQ40, I do the same thing. On uh, on Bug Trio, I do the same thing. I spam cleanse like the entire fight. Well, not the entire fight, but um, the beginning of the fight at least. Um, Molten Core has a lot of stuff like that 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 you you start to get familiar with, and then it's used later on in the later raids and and. You know, that, that concept you'll see constantly throughout the course of vanilla. Yeah, it definitely teaches a lot of classes uh, sort of their basic toolkit. You know, uh, mm -hmm. teaches you how to kill Skull when there's a certain, you know, if there's like a, what are they called? The lava boys that spawn the lava as you have to kill them. Yeah, yeah. I, I forget I forget the name of the mob. Just the lava spawns? Lava spawns. Kill the lava spawns fast. Uh, yeah. You know, stack on this guy. Don't stand in this. You know, use your, like, it, it's very, it's very much a, an educational raid. Teaches you mm -hmm. some basic raiding mechanics you're going to want to know. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, do you guys want? To, do you guys have anything else on MC? Maybe we can start talking about BWL. Yeah, let's do it. Start talking about BWL. Uh, I think BWL. Uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and start, of course. Um, I think BWL is interesting in that it's very different than Molten Core. Molten Core feels very raw. You're you're down. You're you're in the earth. You're in a like you're in a set of tunnels. Right, Blackwing Lair is very ornate. Your your it's it's the the dragon theme is is heavily prevalent throughout the entire dungeon. Uh, you're you're fighting draconids, you're fighting actual dragons, Velstraws, Razor Gore, and uh, the the raid is actually a lot more condensed than Molten Core in, in terms of like the the. The, the travel time on foot is a lot less. Now, now you have to fight through the suppression room, and, and obviously the instance is harder. But it's interesting how they went away from this, like, kind of twisting, weird, like, cavern design to, like, the, oh, okay, you go in here, you go up here, there's a set of stairs, there's here, suppression room up here, you go around this big lab pack area, and then you're in Nefarian's room. I, I think that was interesting, that, that they, they really cut down on the, the size of the raid physically uh in bwl no you're right that is cool i never really thought about that and i know i'm kind of skipping ahead but then they totally did a, a 180 with aq40 yeah, yeah exactly yeah, AQ40 very big like what are they doing but yeah, yeah. I, I never really thought about that but yeah it's it's like it's almost like they took out all the wasted space and they created a situation where every like room in bwl kind of has its like purpose you know what i mean mm -hmm. like its own separate challenge and stuff like the suppression room you know with the rogues disarming the traps and stuff like it makes it so everything is meaningful. Mm -hmm. And I think BWL, it was one of the, the raids they brought up at uh, the 2005 BlizzCon. Like they, they very much had an idea in mind. Like they wanted to make this like the perfect raid. Mm -hmm. And they, there was just a lot of things that went into it. And like from the boss encounters, Razor Gore, right away, your entire like mm -hmm. interpretation of what a raid is, is like flipped upside down if you're coming from MC. You've got unique mechanics. It's just a completely different theme. Mm -hmm. A lot of coordination. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, well, ahead. I was going to say, the, the coordination thing is is something that's it's really prevalent throughout the entirety of vanilla, but you see it more and more with each raid tier. Uh, I mean, I, I know AQ40, like, I mean, you go, even going from MC to BWL and then, like, Scarum and AQ40, and we'll talk more about AQ40 in a little bit, but it's just, like, Scarum is a straight-up coordination check. Like, do you know the fight or not? It's not super like it's not super hard on your gear it's not really a gear check it's just coordination and listening but bwl it's just a step up from mc you see that with razor gore and and there's several different strategies for how to do razor gore uh veil is more of a gear check so i would say it's interesting how they start out bwl with like the first fight is is heavy on coordination and the second fight is like do you have the gear to do veil and then pretty much the rest of the raid is is basically everything in between where you you have a mix of of certain mechanics that you have to be coordinated for and having the right gear right having the proper fire resist for fire maw or something or um 
Chromagus, you have to be well geared and you have to be coordinated. And a lot of people think that Chromagus is actually more difficult than Neph is. So that's that's a that's a good arguable point. Yeah, I like how you guys said it's the next step up from from Molten Core to Nixia because I mean, you can't even get into Blackwing Lay unless you've done uh, Upper Blackrock Spire for the attunement. Mm -hmm. And you will not be successful in Blackwing Lair unless you've got everyone in your raid the the Anixia cloaks. So mm -hmm. it is the next progressive step. You you have to have gone through the proper uh, the proper channels. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And the, the interesting about the Anixia cloak, like what it does is it makes you resistant to basically the, the shadow flame, and like it's just it reminds me a lot of the uh, in the in RuneScape. If you guys played RuneScape back in the day. There's a quest called Dragon Slayer in RuneScape, and I don't know if this was inspired by this at all. I have no idea, but uh, you needed to have like an anti-dragon breath shield in order to like take fire damage in RuneScape. And unless you had that shield, you basically weren't going to be able to kill like the big boss mm. in the Dragon Slayer quest. And like small items like that, like Anixia Scale Cloak is a blue freaking like what is it like item level fifty five. Uh, yeah, the cloak. stats suck. The stats are like they're not good. It's like exactly. sixteen fire resist and some stamina, and but exactly. the big thing is the equip. Yeah. Exactly. It just it has such a unique role to play. And again, it's going back to previous raids to get items that help you in future raids. It just that synergy between the raids. Again, it keeps content relevant and it always keeps things fresh for you. And I really like it. Really like it. Yeah, I think it's really cool. Actually, it's funny. I, I watched uh, today on stream. Today on stream, I, I was watching some vanilla videos as I normally do. I mean, I talk about vanilla basically the entire time on stream. And I was watching a video of uh, actually a preach video. That, that somebody recommended and it was a video of preach and one of his friends watching a bunch of old vanilla footage that his friend had and it shows the neff fight and somebody pointed out that he had no buffs and i was like oh that's interesting he had like a he had a blessing of wisdom a single blessing of wisdom that was that was falling off mm. and i was like wait a second i looked at his cloak and he didn't have an ixia skill cloak on which means that he died whenever Neff dropped and did the Shadow Flame, and they battle resed him. That's why he had no buffs, except for the one self buff that he cast on himself. I, I just thought that was interesting, kind of like seeing that. I was like, okay, I know exactly what happened here. They didn't talk about it on the video, but it's it's very funny. Like, if if you've been involved in vanilla raiding and stuff, like you can you can kind of catch on to little things. And yeah, I don't know. I, go. I got a kick out of that. And then you G kick that guy for not having his clothes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But yeah, no, it's uh, it's cool. I mean, it, it's it's cool that you have these. Uh, again, it's like obstacles, right? Like mini attunements of like, oh, well, you have to kill Anixia enough times to, and you ha okay. First off, UBRS. You mentioned UBRS. You need Finkel's uh, Finkel's dagger, Finkel Skinner, right? You need the skinning enchant. So now you have three fifteen skinning. So now you can skin Anixia, right? So now you have to have done UBRS. You have to have done Anixia. You can skin Anixia. You get enough scales for cloaks. And you have to have killed Anixia enough times prior to BWL being released. It's cool. Like I, like, I don't know. I, I really, really like that. I really like that design. It, it keeps everything intertwined, and it keeps you coming back to the old content, which I think is awesome. Can we just take a moment to appreciate like that level of intricate design? Like, it, it, you know, like putting all the pieces together and like creating the prerequisites for yeah. each raid. Like that's insane, man. Like, it's really, really cool. I always hear that vanilla was successful by accident and that it was just in the right place at the right time. Like, nah, so much thought and effort went into this game. It's insane. And like, we've, we've been 14 years since then. We still don't see this level of intricacy in the game today. It's, it's astounding. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, one thing to talk about, and, and <laughs> I mentioned it for a brief second, but the suppression room. Right, a lot of people call it the depression room. Actually, yeah. <laughs> I I really like the suppression room because it's again, it's it's so it's a challenge that's presented to the raid that's based entirely on coordination. Right, uh, people can do it differently on how they lead it. Like what I like to do is I like to have a hunter generally call out the marks and do the pulls, and it's almost like you're you're watching for the timing of like when when these. Uh, these orc packs are moving around when these draconids are going and then the entire time there's whelps spawning constantly so like one strategy that you use is to to have a tank with like an aoe threat set give him like essence of the pure flame put a pal in his group give him retribution aura get thorns for from a druid 
and you have him tanking a bunch of whelps and holding on to them, but you don't kill them because if you kill them, they'll respawn after a few seconds uh, at each of the suppression points. So you also have to have a rogue at each of these suppression points disarming, do disarm trap on each suppression point in order to have them not suppress the raid. And, and what a suppression does is, I believe it's a 400% attack speed increase. Some, something absurd. Um, and then uh, it, it slows you down. Just I mean, you're, you're like walking in molasses. It's, it's not good, right? So I, I love the suppression room because everybody in the raid has a role. Right, you have you have AOE whenever you want to kill the whelps. You have CC. You have mages polymorphing the orcs. It's really really cool. You know, you might have multiple tanks tanking stuff. I I, I love the suppression room from a design standpoint, despite the fact that so many people hated it so much. And the reason so many people hated it so much is probably why when when Blizzard implemented a, a similar version of it in AQ40, it wasn't nearly as uh, taxing mentally. <laughs> So it wasn't as, as bad on, on people's, on raid leaders' health, probably. You know, just trying to go through and just killing them as opposed to having to coordinate. Okay, rogues, get the traps down. Okay, we got CC out. Okay, well now we're going to AOE. Move up. Everybody move up into the next cubby. I I don't know. It's just something I wanted to talk about. Is uh, Yeah. 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 I, I, I hate the suppression room. I, I really, <laughs> really hate it. In fact, can I, can I give a confession to you guys and you have to promise not to tell anyone? Like, keep it between us three? Yeah, no, we yeah. shouldn't tell anybody at all. Yeah, I promise. Okay. There's been uh, once, maybe twice, maybe twice in my life when I've been at the suppression room and I've followed another warlock oh and I've gosh. gone AFK. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and not participated at all. I hate it. I freaking hate the suppression room. Dude. Uh, yeah, don't, oh, only once or twice. Only maybe three times. Yeah, don't tell yeah. anyone, though. Okay. Do you know how frustrating that is? As, as a raid leader? <laughs> not for me, though. Yeah, not, not for, for you. Of course not for you. Frick, man. You gotta be kidding me. Yeah. The amount of times I've had to yell at people for, like, AFKing in suppression room. <laughs> like, it's dude, like, you can't stand there. Like, we have to move. Like, we have to go. No, yeah. I put someone on follow. Well, okay, know? at least you were courteous yeah. enough. Excuse yeah. me. Yeah, you were courteous enough to put somebody <laughs> on follow. The LFR of vanilla, you know? <laughs> <laughs> man. So... Uh, after BWO, let's let's talk about ZG. ZG is something. The ZG patch in general is is huge for casters. So stay safe. Do you want to do you want to start us off there? Yeah. Well, I mean, up until ZG, casters were really lacking for uh, hit gear, especially, but crit gear to to some extent as well. And ZG introduced a lot of hit gear. Uh, mages have six percent hit from their talent tree. Uh, warlocks have zero. So this is a very big patch uh, for warlocks. Warlocks start. Um, getting a little bit better now warlocks are very very gear dependent well casters in general are gear dependent everyone's gear dependent what am i kidding everyone is gear dependent but they're just it just happened to be the case that casters didn't really have the gear early game uh, that melee dps did so yeah a lot of hit gear uh and i think just a, a lot of melee hit gear as well right uh they added like a hit cloak uh, a, a hit cloak with strength on it i believe um yeah so, th so there was some some extra hit gear for melee as well and also an ak20 which which is also a a, a catch up raid. So in AQ twenty there was a uh, an additional hit neck necklace added, uh, additional in addition to uh, the Anixia tooth necklace for so, melee DPS. For yeah. melee DPS, yeah. So uh, yeah. just in those in those two catch up raids and and really you can kind of you can kind of group ZG and AQ twenty together because despite the fact that they were on different patches they they both served a similar purpose. Exactly. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I think it was like sort of an attempt to find a middle ground between five man dungeons and, and 40 man raids. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, it, I, I don't I like 40 man raids, but I don't think necessarily just having more people in a raid means more fun. And mm -hmm. uh, I think Blizzard kind of realized this uh, with these with these 20 man raids and then transitioning to 25 man raids and Burning Crusade. Uh, they were looking for a smaller raid size. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, personally, AQ20 and ZG are actually my two favorite raids in Vanilla WoW. I think they're a lot of fun, mm. and uh, they're more. Maybe I'm a casual gamer. They're more kind of casual. You can do whenever you want with whoever you want. Like it's not very serious. It's just a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot more fun. Exactly. With smaller raid sizes, you can just you can tick up the the mechanics a little bit. Um, obviously, people become more responsible for their actions. You can't have like ten people die in a twenty man raid and expect it for it to be successful. Stuff like that, and uh, really like these catch up mechanics. It almost like it filled a void in the game at the time. 
obviously, you know, in vanilla, only a couple of epics drop off of each boss. It's not like today where, you know, six or seven epics drop off of like a 20 man, you know, raid boss or something mm -hmm. like that. You only had a few items. So even if you had already done Molten Core, Blackwing Lair, you could still go into Zul Groove for extra pieces, maybe like, you know, differently itemized pieces with hit gear and so on. But also you may just, you may not have gotten certain pieces by that time. It just, it's yep. just how it was. And, um, and again, it allows you to kind of, it serves as kind of like a void filler, you know, between basically, um, you know, some of the later raids and, and, and the earlier raids. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I haven't eaten since like 6 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> That's Sorry. cool, dude. The, um, another thing to, to note with AQ20 and with ZG is that in the life of Retail Vanilla WoW, that's when the game kind of started booming pretty pretty big time. Like, you'll see so many people, and even even big-time WoW players today, a lot of the big-time streamers, they might have started playing around this time or, or maybe even a little bit later. That's because that's it, it was a big point of growth in the game. I mean, it's just, it's just natural, right? The game's popular. The game's going well. Well, you know, as Blizzard, they have to see, like, okay, we need to add a way for people to maybe maybe not get gear that's quite as good, but at least it's attainable by somebody who's not able to get into a forty man raid, get into MC, get into BWL, but it's it's attainable by a smaller group and it serves uh, a similar or it, it serves as something that's usable, right? Something that's good enough. Adding some what I call just green stats, right? Green stats plus damage, hit, crit, stuff like that that yeah, a lot of uh, like the tier zero doesn't have I, I think you're right and i'm trying to think correct me if i'm wrong zulgrub is the first raid in the history of wow that doesn't have an attunement process you can just go in right yeah yes. i believe so uh, oh, oh well unless unless you count ubrs unless like, you, you can't you gotta UBRS. get the seal of ascension you have to get the seal of ascension and the, and the oh, one person right. has to have that though yeah you're right well, and L well, LBRS, LBRS is still ten man as well. There you go. But, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But but still, like for for like, a lot of people don't consider UBRS, LBRS like raid content, right? Yeah. So, but uh, as as far as like what's considered big time raid content is ZG, right? So yeah, yeah. that's that's the first one that you really don't need an attunement for. And, and like it even like I know we call it a catch up raid. It still benefits even like the most cutting edge players. You've got all the enchants in there. Yeah. So it, it just. Again, it gives you an incentive to do it, even if you've already cleared the content. Come back, make sure to get your enchants. You know, make sure to grind the rep, get exalted, get your shoulder enchant. Obviously, your head and uh, your legs. It's like, again, it just it it gives everybody a reason to go in there, whether you're a casual or, or you're hardcore. You can always benefit from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's awesome. I think that's that's amazing design. That's a great freaking idea. Them them yeah. having done that because. Uh, and same thing, this is the same thing with, with BWL, with Molten Core. There's a lot of gear in Molten Core that you won't need in the AQ patch. There's a lot of gear in Molten Core that you won't need once you get to the BWL patch, maybe, right? Nah, BWL, not, not quite as much, but, but you see my point. It's as you, as you go up, you need less and less. But, you know, I, I might be the top geared Fury Warrior on the server, except for the fact that I'm missing an Onslaught Girdle. Right, I might be the best tank on the server, except for the fact that I don't have uh, Thunder Fury bindings. Right, so that's going to keep these these more higher geared players coming back to the forty man raids. Outside of just doing the right thing, and once you got your gear, you got to keep running it so so the other players in your guild can get it. But the less geared guys, the guys who are new recruits, those guys get an opportunity to get the gear in in the earlier raids. Those guys get the opportunity to get gear in ZG to catch up. Just like those guys still need onslaught girdle, those guys still need thunder fury bindings. They still need their ZG enchants. I, I think that's great. I think that's that's um, absolutely incredible, amazing design, and goes back to what I was saying earlier. That's something that's really not good about Legion, right? That's something that's really bad about how how retail is now, where they just kind of like toss the old raid tier out the window. Yeah, and like one of the cool things, like you you kind of brushed on it a little bit, the idea of you know, progression beyond just gear. Like one thing right now, I don't know why they took out all the enchants from the game, basically. Mm. I, I, they took out the enchants, took out the gems, that came to DBC, but like in general, like they stripped so much of this, like you could call it like side progression in WoW or like horizontal progression, some people call it. Like, dude, 
gr doing the the exalted grind to to get your shoulder enchants in ZG like that's it feels good when you get there. Mm -hmm. And like it doesn't it doesn't depend on you getting lucky on like an RNG drop and having enough DKP or whatever to get the item. It's like a nice personal form of progression aside from gear that makes you feel like you're getting stronger, but mm -hmm. at the same time it has its own different mechanic. Like this kind of stuff is really really cool and again it keeps things relevant for you, makes it satisfying, you don't have to depend on gear. I have no clue why stuff like this was stripped from the game. It's one of those things that just makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. But, mm. but yeah, it's it's there. It's there in vanilla. Mm -hmm. For sure. Let's talk about AQ40 a little bit. Uh, do one of you guys want to want to kick us off with some AQ40 chat? Well, I'll talk about AQ20. How about that? AQ20 is my second favorite raid in the game. Oh, you want to keep going? Uh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I, I guess I didn't go enough on AQ20. You're right. Okay. No, my bad. But yeah, uh, so yeah. It, it continued uh, sort of the, the design philosophy of ZG, right? They, mm -hmm. I think they saw that ZG was very successful, so they, they added a, an AQ20, and it, it's great. Uh, AQ40 is, uh, it's, it's probably, like, I wouldn't, would you guys say Blackwing Layer is, like, really very hardcore? I think most guilds are probably going to clear Blackwing Layer. Yeah. yeah I mean... Uh... Yeah, I think I think the beginning whenever they add the first whenever you add Blackwing Layer, that was kind of like the first step of starting to separate the yeah. the hardcore and the progression and the casual guilds. And uh, something that I this is kind of not to derail, but but it's something I really think it's important to touch on is I I personally see there being three types of guilds in Vanilla WoW. There's hardcore guilds. These are your like server first. These are the guys who are clearing the the first few weeks, or really the first week at this point. Your progression guilds, which complete the current tier of content, the current the current level of content, in a reasonable amount of time, maybe maybe within a month or so, right? Then you have the more casual guilds, who are basically finishing the previous tier of content, as the first tier of content is coming out, right? They're basically a tier behind, and. Uh, I think once you add a second tier, BWL, that's whenever you start to see the separation happen. AQ40, you start to see a bigger separation happen until you get to the point yeah. where you have Nax and uh, there's 20, 20, you know, 20, less than 25 or less guilds. I think it was 23 yeah. that, that cleared. Yeah. I was going to say AQ40, in my opinion, is like the first, it's the first like big separator of, mm -hmm. of these guilds you listed. It's the first time you start seeing a big difference between who is clearing these raids and who is not clearing these raids. You know, it, it, there there are some you know there are some hard mechanics in AQ40. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like, and you know, specifically AQ40 did a lot of really good things for the game. Like when you think about it, like basically the tokens and the itemization in AQ40 very different than it was previously. But before I get to that, um, one thing like I just noticed this while we were talking. It seems like every single raid in vanilla has like its own really iconic like event or something tied to it obviously encourage has the the war effort the openings of the gates of encourage like probably the most iconic memorable event in world of warcraft history mm -hmm. but then you look at like black uh like blackwing lair you you have you know it's not technically associated with blackwing lair but you've got like the crazy anixia attunement you've got like the suppression room and bwl um in noxtramas you've got the crazy attunement you got the fact that only you know 23 us guilds uh cleared it um molten core it's just it's got, you know, Thunder Fury, for example. It seems like every single raid... There, there's, like, like, iconic pieces to each raid. Exactly. And it just yeah. it makes each one memorable. Like, it just... You cannot discuss a vanilla raid without being like, oh, that's the raid that did this, or brought this to the game, or it had that crazy event tied to it. Mm -hmm. it just, Scourge it just, Invasion for Nax. Exactly. Like, yeah. it's just so iconic in so many ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. And, and back to sort of what we talked about at the very beginning of the podcast today, how we said, you know, raiding, it starts maybe at level 15, building your character. With this with this AQ opening event, yep. you can be level fifteen and turn in cloth and help and open up the gates for your server. Like that, that's so cool, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can be a total like you know, you, you could be a nobody, right? You could be a nobody. You're brand new. You're a noob, just just started fresh on the server. You just started playing WoW, and you just see all these people like, wait, what's going on, right? It's like, oh, we need to turn in cloth to open up the gates. You, you might not hit level 60, you might not ever raid, you might not have any idea, Any you might never meet anybody who kills C'Thun, right? But you just made an impact on your server by turning in some linen cloth, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. That's wild. Like, I think I think that's so cool, you know? And, and it, it might be something like, oh, if you didn't turn it in, somebody else would have. Okay, sure. But, like, you as, like, a fresh player, as, as a noob, like, 
that feels kind of cool. Like, man, I just helped open up the freaking gates of AQ. That's wild. I don't know. Love it. Love it. Yeah, absolutely. But, um, but yeah, speaking of like, you know, we brought up resistances earlier. Another raid where you need resistance. Another of interesting mechanics. I don't know, Stacey, if you want to talk about Warlock tanking and AQ? Mm. Well, yeah, I mean, Warlock tanking comes into play on the on the famous Twin Emperor fight, right? You're going to want some Shadow Resistance, probably going to go uh, Soul Link spec to get the extra uh, <clears throat> damage reduction. You probably have a, a Fell Hunter out for the extra, like, 60 resistance you get from that. It's, uh, it's a very unique thing. In fact, uh, I don't think Warlocks do that again until, what, uh, uh, the, the Illidan fight in Burning Crusade. Is mm -hmm. that right? Oh, you know what? You have you have a mage tank in Gruul's Lair. Anyway, I'm kind of getting off topic, but yeah, like it's it's such a it's such a cool, unique uh, event that uh, you know someone gets to take a fight who's who's a caster or or a non-tank class. Exactly goes back to the whole putting a spotlight on your class and like showing the value you have as like a specific class, and just you know using all of the classes you know utility basically going SL and just you know changing your spec for it and again like it just. It's one of those things that's just so unique to the original version of the game. You saw it a little bit later on, but really that first era of World of Warcraft. Um, I just think stuff like that is really, really cool. Mm -hmm. For sure. Uh, something else is, you know, you, you mentioned resistance gear. Every raid so far, you, you've had, like, fire resistance that you needed. You've needed, uh, you needed fire resist. You've needed a little bit of shadow resist is, is feasible, right? Uh, nature resist in AQ40 is pretty big time, right? Because you need to have, uh, on certain fights, whether that's Viscidus, Bug Trio is nice to have some nature resist, Huhuran is the big one, right? So so Princess Huhuran, you have 15 people. The 15 closest people to the tank or, or to the boss are considered soakers. So outside of your tanks, uh, you need to have enough people that have 250, 255 nature resistance in order to be able to soak enough poison damage whenever she enrages, nature damage whenever she enrages with her poisons, uh, in order to survive for like the last 30% of the fight. And the uh, you're not gonna do a lot of damage, that's not your job, your job is not to do damage, and, and you'll see this a lot in AK40 and how the design of the raids change, because melee are pretty dominant early on, Later on is whenever the casters take over, whether that's because of connection time, whether that's because your role changes as, as far as like being a soaker goes. Um, and also the fact that mages can finally spec fire in AQ because so many things are immune or resistant to fire in BWL in Molten Core. So you can finally spec fire, which is just naturally a higher DPS spec. On top of the fact that you've gotten the gear upgrades from ZG, you've got more hit, you've got more crit. It's it's a it's a recipe for for mages to really take off once that hits. You know everybody's kind of roles shift around depending on the fights, and uh, you know having heavy nature resistance is is very very important for uh, just to get through. You know that's what you got to do. Like you got to sacrifice, right? I'm not going to do a lot of damage on Huron, but it's going to make the fight way easy if everybody's got 250 nature resistance, right? Or all the soakers do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, that's the kind of sacrifice for the benefit of the raid that is very common in Vanilla WoW. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so, to kind of uh, to kind of move on a little bit, and, and, and uh, we kind of have some plans for, for what we might want to do to talk a little bit more about Nax in the future, but we're going to touch on Nax a little bit. And uh, the big thing, the big thing that you see in Nax is the power creep. Right, and, and it, this now we're talking a little bit more about itemization and how throughout the course of vanilla, like the itemization, we, we've touched on a little bit and how you've gotten more green stats, you've gotten more stuff like that, but you've got a, a big jump in power creep, and in my opinion, deservedly so. Right, what what is power creep? Power creep is the progression of the strength of items, and this is something that happens in MMOs, and it's it's usually it usually has a negative connotation. I don't think it always is a bad thing, and that's one thing I want to make sure whenever. I'm talking about power creep, people understand, is that power creep's not always a bad thing. It's something that makes sense. You want to have the next tier of gear feel stronger, right, while still having previous tiers of gear feel valuable. And uh, in, in Nax, you get a really hard power creep spike. And, uh, you know, th there's actually a couple of reasons for that. And that's, one, there's a big jump in item level. 
Item level is a thing in vanilla WoW, but it's used as a variable to check how many itemization points an item is going to have. But not only that, like you've seen more green stats and stuff on items, the gear has gotten more optimized, right? You take the Lawbringer set, which is kind of like a mishmash of stats, and it's kind of more of like a PvP healing set, and the Judgment set for Paladins is more of like a spell power, like Shockadin set, really. And... Now you get to the point where, you know, Avenger set is a little bit better. It tightens down. It tightens down more and more, you know, as you get up the tiers. That's a retribution set. Like, that set, like, you know it's useful for retribution. But then you get to tier three. And and Nax is such, like, a hardcore raiding environment that all the tier sets were designed for completing Nax and for uh, what specs people are more most likely to be playing. And, and again, we... we I almost said we didn't have tokens. You did have tokens in Nax. This was a uh, well. This was the second uh, instance of having tokens, and um, the tokens in Nax didn't work like they did in Burning Crusade, where where you had different specs that you could choose from for the gear. It was it was almost like a like a trial run of like how the tokens and stuff were going to work. Well, not well for a full set how the tokens and stuff were going to work, and then it, it slowly evolved from AQ40 to Nax to uh, to how you saw it in BC. But, um, but yeah, you had stuff like leg plates of carnage, like plate DPS legs with 42 strength on it. Just, just insane, insane stuff. The Paladin Tier 3 has, like, stamina, intellect, plus healing, crit, and mana per 5. Like, those are the only five stats, I believe, I believe, that are on the entirety of the set. There's no strength, there's no spirit, there's no melee crit, there's no nothing. I mean, it's, it has only these five stats, and it's very, very heavily optimized, to be as, as strong as possible. So you have a big spike in power creep from both an item or item level standpoint and then an itemization standpoint. How the how the points are allocated. Pretty pretty crazy. Absolutely. I mean, uh, to to really like put this into perspective, depending on the class, uh, the tier three gear from Nexramus is only between ten and twenty percent weaker than tier four gear mm. in Burning Crusade. It is very, very strong tier three gear, very good. And that's that's why it lasted people into Karazhan, into Gruul's Lair, into Megtheridon's Lair, mm -hmm. when Burning Crusade came out. Hmm, Imagine sure. that today. It's just like today's not even close. Uh, <laughs> if you're like level 100, what, the difference between level 100 and 101 green is like astronomical. But um, but yeah, speaking of upping the ante, uh, Nax Ramus also brought like a plethora of different mechanics to World of Warcraft. Mm -hmm. Um, almost every single fight in Naxxramas is just, it almost blows you away. They're so unique, introducing a lot of different concepts, obviously allowing a lot of classes to shine, but even just, you know, crazy mechanics like, you know, the, the reverse polarity on, on Thaddeus and stuff like that. And if, if you look at a fight like Kel'Thuzad, where just so much is going on and there's so many different, like almost phases of the fight with so many different things you need to manage, it, it just it takes it to another level. And I think it really sets mm. kind of the, the stage for the Burning Crusade and, and the mechanics we saw there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were, you know, when, when they were developing Next Ramus, they were also developing Burning Crusade at the same time. And so I think when you look at Next Ramus's gear itemization and the boss mechanics, uh, it's very similar, actually. Next Ramus almost feels sort of Burning Crusade-ish. Mm. Uh, and I think, I think it's because they were, they were sort of co-creating them in the same time frame. And and like you said, with the to with the tokens and the itemization, uh, they were before patch 2.0 already kind of making some Burning Crusade esque changes. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. I mean, it just it's crazy because Next Ramus is kind of like the pinnacle of I've just I, I'd say I don't I'd even call it like the pinnacle of MMORPGs when it comes to like exclusivity and stuff. We said 23 uh, 23 guilds only cleared in the U.S. And, uh, you know, a lot of that obviously has to do with, with some of the, the strange encounters that it had. Four horsemen coming to mind right away, requiring eight tanks. Um, you know, different encounters that just required a lot of different things out of guilds. And, of course, the insane attunement process. I mean, it, it's insane. Like, having a fight require eight of a specific spec. Not just eight yeah. tanks. Basically, eight prot warriors. You need yeah. eight prot warriors. It, it, like nothing like that has ever been done before nor since i think yeah your your raid comp was about as optimized as the gear was so i mean it's just like yeah. everything really tightens up and gets super hardcore um so that'll be uh yeah that's 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 one that's definitely uh it's a whole nother animal compared to compared to the previous raids for sure 
Uh, something else that gets added in uh, in Nax is Atish, right? It's it's the first caster legendary. So uh, at this point, you had Thunder Fury, you had uh, you had the Hand of Rag. You technically you had a necklace too, but that was that was not supposed to be in the game. <laughs> but uh, the Atish is something that it's it, druids could use it, mages could use it, warlocks could use it, and priests could use it. It, it was a staff designed for these uh, these four classes, and you had a choice. You would do a quest chain, and, and you would get the pieces, the splinters together, and uh, it was actually a medieval staff. And it's so interesting, right? Because one, you, you get a, a choice of which set of stats you want, basically. Um, but it's like it's it's tailored to your class. But also the on use, the on use of Atish was that it would create a portal to Karazhan, right, to Medivh's home. So, kind of kind of two part deal here, where like you said, stay safe. They were creating the Burning Crusade instances at the same time. They were designing them at the same time. But also the fact that Karazhan was in the game in vanilla. I mean, so, so much stuff was in the game. Caverns of Time, all this stuff was in the game in vanilla. Um, I don't think that they... At this point in the game, they, they knew that they were doing Burning Crusade. Right? They knew that they were doing Burning oh, yeah. Crusade. Yeah. yeah. But to kind of like... Uh, I think it's a cool segue. Right? For for the... You had 23 guilds complete Nax. Less than that. I don't know. I wonder how many Atishas there were. In, in vanilla, I'm sure people went back and got it in, in Burning Crusade and stuff. But in vanilla, I wonder how many Atishas there were. Well, you had to kill Kel'Thuzad, right, to get it. Yeah. And uh, I'm nine, I'm pretty sure of that. And so if, if 23 guilds cleared Naxxramas, probably sub five, probably less than five Atishas were made during vanilla WoW because it's incredibly hard to make. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, people went back during Burning Crusade. But yeah, I also want to throw out uh, Atisha's Warlock Prio, okay? The Warlock, <laughs> he activates the portal, he goes to Naxxramas in Burning Crusade, he summons his, his raid group for, for Karazhan. Actually, and, uh, it makes sense. That does make sense. Yeah, think about it. I, I hate that you have a legitimate reasoning for that. <laughs> That's really good. That's really Interestingly good. Interestingly enough, actually, Karazhan was intended to be a part of Vanilla. So it, mm -hmm. I wonder... I, I mean, it, it seems pretty obvious, but I wonder if if that was it. It was just m maybe that was just part of it, you know, just going from from one raid to the next. You know what I mean? Yeah, and maybe maybe that was their original intent was to have Karazhan after Nax anyway, yeah. like regardless of deciding, like because at that point they you know they were doing BC, they knew about it, um, yeah. but I, I wonder if that was their intent, regardless to go Nax and then and then Karazhan. Or if that was something that they were like, oh, we're gonna do Karazhan next, and let that, this would be a fun little thing, a cool little segue to to throw in on the the Nax legendary. So, yeah. cool deal for sure. Still, I I want to ask you guys in chat, and I'll ask you guys as well. Have you guys ever seen an Atish in game in retail? Wow, I've never. I've played I a lot of retail. I've never seen one. I have. It was it was the guild leader. I can't remember his name. The guild name was Prophecy. I believe on Alliance Kel'Thuzad, it was a dwarf priest. He was the guild leader. I, I believe that's if I'm remembering it right. Uh, man, I wish I could remember his name, but he had Natish. I, I I very specifically remember that. I hope I'm not misremembering, because that's a very specific thing to misremember and look like an idiot for. <laughs> but but I, I think I think that's what it was. Yeah, so that's crazy impressive. The biggest regret in my life out of anything I've ever done. Real life, it doesn't matter, is not farming a Tish during Burning yeah. Crusade. Going back and running Karazhan every week during Burning Crusade. Man, yeah. if, I could go, if I could go back in time. Dude, for yeah. me, Corrupted Ashbringer. Corrupted Ashbringer and, yeah. and Might of Menethil. I don't know why I, like, I didn't go back and farm Old Nax until like the last two or three weeks. Like I, I heard about a Nax farming group that, that was going on like three weeks before BC patch was coming in. And... You mean Wrath Patch? Or, uh, Wrath Patch, excuse me. Wrath Patch was coming in in BC. And I don't think I got in the first week. I don't think I got in the first week, and then I went, like, the last two weeks. And, like, a hunter got a Corrupted Ashbringer, and I was so pissed off, dude. Oh, my God. <laughs> I was so pissed. But, oh, I mean, I've been taking gear from Warriors for, for ages, so, I mean, <laughs> I, guess it, I guess that's just desserts, right? <laughs> you, you know what, you guys? You guys worship this. Let me show you. You guys just look at that. That's what you guys worship. Get yeah, it's here. true. It's true. It's here. true. It's the light. It's the light. The light, dude. Yeah. The light. <laughs> so uh, is there anything that you guys uh, would like to add? Was there, was there anything else you guys would like to hit on? 
Um, before we go, I mean, I, the two biggest points for me when it comes to vanilla rating, uh, especially like with classic coming up, because you know this is the classic cast and whatnot. Of course. I think a lot of people, and even very talented raiders today, are going to be surprised at a lot of different things. Sure, you don't have the same level of mechanical complexity and like scripted boss encounters that you do uh, today, but things like just threat management, you know, mm. positioning. Um, not being able to heroic leap out of the fire. All of these things actually make vanilla rating. It, it's not a cakewalk. It, it can be punishing at times, especially even though the mechanics, they might be easier than what you're used to. If you don't do them, a lot of times it can it can really, really punish you. It's one of the reasons why no Australian guilds actually killed Thaddeus. Yeah. Because of the latency on, on the polarization. If you just have one guy mess up on Thaddeus and 40 man next, you're going to wipe. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's definitely a lot of punishing mechanics like that. And, and the second thing again is going back to like the feeling of prestige like it just it's such a great way to reward the effort of players without gear you don't need gear to make things rewarding and i think that's always kind of been a mistake basically since wrath of the lich king by creating so much gear in the game you kind of just marginalize that experience of getting gear it doesn't feel rewarding now when i get like a mythic titan forged cloak or something right. like that uh, because i know i'm just going to get another piece of gear and another piece of gear and you know, I can get like 20 pieces of gear a day while I'm gearing up. It doesn't feel satisfying. Mm -hmm. But yeah. again, yeah, yeah. I, I, I didn't say, you mentioned you mentioned how unforgiving uh, vanilla rating is. I mean, in, in Legion, what's the longest ability cooldown, like five minutes or something? And then every attempt, if you wipe, <laughs> it resets uh, for you automatically. So in vanilla, WoW, if you're progressing, you know, you, you have 30 minute cooldowns, an hour long cooldown, like lay on hands or something. Yeah. You might only get one good solid attempt per hour. So if you wipe, your cooldowns are blown, your world buffs are gone, you got to run back in, you got to buff up, like you don't have mass res, it, it can't, it is very unforgiving to, to die in vanilla. Yeah. Well. Dying's not good. Well, like, yeah, like I, I think lay on hands is, is my longest cooldown with 10 minutes in Legion. And in retail, I mean, you take something like shield wall, like using shield wall is part of strategy in in. Vanilla WoW, like I know on Chromagus, we talked about Chromagus and BWL. He has an enrage phase, right? He's getting trank shotted and stuff through through like the mini the mini enrages, right? That he does. So you suppress him with trank shot, and then he has a hard enrage at twenty percent. And at that point, okay, we're going to improve lay on hands on the tank, so he has a thirty percent armor buff, and the tank is shield walling. If you guys don't kill him, especially early on, you, you don't have to shield wall later on when you start to out gear it and all this, but early on. Part of the strategy is for the tank to shield wall for that last 20% almost preemptively. So if you blow it, now you have to have another tank come in and tank it on the next attempt with shield wall. Yep. And that other tank is probably not going to be as uh, as well geared as the first tank that you chose to tank Romagus. And another thing to mention is is a lot of times you can say like, oh, like I'm, I'm reading these fight mechanics. Oh, this is easy. Like, you know, run out of this, do that. He's going to sweep, whatever, all that stuff. Okay, fine, great. You understand it, right? You understand it. But there's 39 other people <laughs> that are there that are there with you that may not, right? And and I think that's something that uh, you need to you need to consider. So I, I think it's going to be something that uh, it's a lot of moving parts. A lot of moving parts. Now, and I think the best Legion raiders are going to be really really because they're good at games. Are you good at games? Then then you're going to be good at games, right? But uh, I do think that the average player is going to be surprised. I think they're going to be surprised. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Should we wrap it up, guys? I think we should. I think uh, I think I think that's it. All right. Thank you guys for watching. This is Classcast episode six. Wow. Well, yeah, six episodes. It's been six. Wow. It's been six, and uh, it has been a, a really long period of time for six. So maybe we should. Uh, maybe we'll do a few more of these in the uh, in the coming weeks at a higher frequency. So. Thank you guys so much for joining us. We'll see you guys next time. Live. Take it easy. Live. Okay, Maybe. bye. Maybe. <laughs>